Welcome to lecture number six. Name is Stefan Eriksson and today, as you can maybe see in the art console up here, or this is actually the script actually, to be correct, we are going to be looking at linear regression. So this is also what I call regression week. Um, where while not a lot of students in this class have, well, as we already checked here earlier, are familiar with linear regression, we're going to take a very practical approach. I'm going to explain simply the why are we doing this? What are we trying to accomplish with linear regression? And go for some simple interpretation of coefficients, look at predictions versus the actual values, and also look at R squared, for instance, the coefficient of determination, if you want to call it like that, or let's call it the goodness of fit of the model. I'm going to explain all these things in, well, the simplest possible way, because this is up for other courses to explain a complete theoretical layout. But I also do some give some links to crash courses and this kind of thing, so you can get the behind knowledge. Please note that these kind of crash courses stuff is not relevant for passing this course. What we're focusing on here, and also is relevant for your assignment, is to be able to apply linear regression techniques in R, especially using the LM package standing for linear models. Okay, setting the setting the stage. Of course, setting my directory. We move down to example number one and. This is already what I warned guy, you guys about two weeks ago. This is data we're going to start with again. And this is the Galton data set. You know, the one with the heights of the children and heights of the parents. If you don't remember, we can always just check here. Question mark Galton and then hopefully, boom, it's right here. So we can see what do we have. We have the height of the mid parent, so the average of mommy and daddy. And then we have the height of the child. So that's the situation we have right now. Starting with this data set and uh, starting with overviewing, I'm going to go relatively fast over the first data set. Well, because we've seen it before and I'm actually just recapping this and maybe filling out some blanks as we go. So before we get to what I'm actually trying to accomplish with linear regression, let's look at these uh, histograms. Of course, I'm using the par function here to set up that we can have two histograms, in this case, stacked on top of each other, two comma one, as we can see. So we want, in this case, two rows, one column. Let me stretch this a little bit so they look a little nicer to see. I know I'm missing a corner down here. You can't see this is 74, which also should be 74. So that's where my picture's in the way. So uh, this is totally a 74 in this corner, guys. So what we can see here is a histogram how the distribution is of the mid height of the parent versus the height of the children. And you already get some kind of an idea how this is distributed, how, you know, over time, children may be taller or get taller. This is also a lot of other things, but it's also determined by genetics and also well, how tall your parents were. You're more likely to be taller if both your parents were tall. That's at least what I've been taught. I'm not the, that kind of scientist, but okay, it seems reasonable to believe. We also can look at just the quantiles again. We've done that earlier, so I'm just going to put this one a little down here. Then we look at the quantiles up here. Nothing we haven't seen before, so that should hopefully not come as a surprise and shock you, and uh, this should be all fine. We can, of course, also just look at the summary of the data set. Oh, I need coffee. Mm. Ah, there we go. Where we, of course, get the quantile. So this, of course, was also very relevant for earlier, but we also dealt with one in week four and a little in week five. And while I talked about all these combinatorics, we talked Monty Hall last week, Today, we're just drawing a lot of lines, essentially. Because what is linear regression? Well, it is regression that is linear. Haha, <laughs> that is a really bad way of saying it, but that's essentially what you're going to see a lot of here. I'm going to go a little about the assumptions, but again, that is not the purpose of this. We're just going to execute. So what we do here, we first, of course, set up this data set here as a data frame. The code here is also something you can find back in lecture four. So indeed here we can get the frequency data set here. So click on this here, we can see what do we have? How many do how many observations do we have when we, for instance, have the child height being, take an example here, 64.2 versus where the parent's height is 64. Well, there's four in this group, so frequency is four. So this is just a nice little frequency overview. So let's just remove that one away again and simply could see how we can do this. We can, of course, what we need to do in order to do to do this properly. One thing I should maybe show you. Let's go to the frequency data set up here. You notice if I hover over there, these are factors. These are different factors with, in this case, 14 levels, many levels. 
And this one here is a factor with 11 levels. So when you do linear regression like this, we can really use factor variables in this way. We have to convert them to numeric, at least for the purpose of today's lecture. So we have to go as numeric and that we have to take a so-called detour over the character lane. And that's why we do the frequency data child here, first as a character and then as numeric. And then we save it in here, frequency dollar sign child, okay? So we simply make sure this data set here, these columns here. So where does it show the factor stuff? Well, that is hard for me to show because I just changed it. But if you want to see the factor stuff, I'm referring to a comment here by Conrad. If you open the data set here and you can simply just hover over here, you hover over the names here of the columns like I do here. Why it doesn't show for you guys, I don't know because it's on my screen. But now when I see back on the broadcast here, you don't see this here. But if you hover over child and parent, it will show you column one numeric with ranges. And the thing is here, now mine has changed to numeric now because when you run the code that is displayed here on line 57 and 58, it changed into numeric. And now we can start actually drawing our plots. And these plots here are of course built on ggplot. ggplot is of course a more advanced drawing package or a plotting package, which in this case here, make sure that we can build our frame, build everything. We build it piece by piece using this uh, geom plots, scale size, these points, and simply can build up our, um, what do you call it in this case, build our plot bit by bit. And you're welcome, Conrad, happy to help. So what we see on my plot screen down here, I'm going a little shortly over this, sorry for that guys, but this is simply because we've covered this already in lecture four, but we should build up to the whole linear regression point. What are we trying to accomplish? When you look at a two dimensional, it might be easy if I do this, but my screen is over there. But when we're looking at a two dimensional space, as you see here, what linear regression is trying to achieve is draw the best possible line where there's least squared errors. That is, we try to draw, or draw the line that fits the best through this cloud of data points. When I run this code here using the LM package, you can see here, actually you're regressing child on parent. So we're actually writing up a linear regression function here where we're trying to explain the height of the child as a function of the parent using the data set from Galton. I got a question from Yannick Slee and uh, no worries, I see Streamlab removes it, but I have it here on my board here. The def off does not work when I try to run it. So what we also did in question four, it's, a, it's about which one you set as the active plotting, uh, active plotting point. Because now when I'm trying to plot here, the second one here, uh, then it's very important you def off first. So I don't know why it doesn't work with you, but we can always look at it a little later. That's no worries, no problem at all. But if I try to make this linear regression here, we obtain a coefficient of the intercept. So that is where it will uh, intersect with the y-axis and here we get a coefficient of the slope. So basically you learn how to draw lines in a two-dimensional space. You learned that back in high school or even earlier sometimes. So it's basically go one out and how much up, right? That's how this, uh, this slope works, at least in a two-dimensional setting. We could also go up to explain it by two parameters or two in independent variables. Then we'd be in a three-dimensional space, but anything beyond that will be very hard to draw. I don't know how you draw in five or six dimensional space, but we're not going to try that here. So in this case here, as I said, we're trying to explain the height of the child as a function of the mid height of the parent. Let's be clear, it was the mid height of the parent because that's what we had in the data set. Now, we can of course now with the same plot here, the only thing I add additional here, I add in this line here, you see linear modeling where the formula is Y on X. That's more the general formulation, right? So by doing this here, we obtain what is known as the linear regression line through this here, okay? Um, I got a question from Anastasia. Anastasia, could you elaborate on that? Ah, SE as false here is to not get the standard errors in this case here, and that is for 007. I like saying 007, just skip the rest of your name, sorry, but this is case 007. So SE here refers to the standard errors. We don't need them in this case here. 
because attached to each of these um, coefficients, there's a standard error, so the error that you commit. That's the easiest way to do this. Ah, thanks for, thanks for the clarification, Anastasia, about the whole multidimensional thing. Luckily, we don't have to worry much about that. So, now, let's leave this graph for a moment and dive more into the whole regression thing. But first, I got a question here as well. Uh, I have a deleted message here. What happened? Ah, uh, MV asks here for line 32, what part adds the frequencies in the as data frame or table? So in this case here, we go up to line 32 quickly to uh, cover this question. What line 32? I don't have a line 32. I think I pushed mine afterwards. So I think you may be looking at it here. It is the table function that you're referring to here. The table function. So that will be the table function. I hope that is okay. Now I can see my moderator here is being pretty aggressive, but luckily don't worry about if you see the message get deleted, I still have them here on, well, phone. Fantastic, right? So then I can always check back on everything. Now let's scroll down again and dive into this linear regression world because what are we doing here? Let's try to estimate this linear regression model, save it as the name output. And here we are getting used to the same linear regression. And then look at the regression summary that uh, R can produce for us. So, okay. This is a lot of new stuff. So looking at this here, you see the whole call here. And this here by no means look like a regression table you would see in a journal style uh, thing. That will be a whole new way you would have to transform this first. But this is the raw output. Here again, we see the estimate of the coefficient here for the intercept. That's the same as you saw before. And of course, the estimate of the slope. Now, we already dealt a little with hypothesis testing in a previous assignment, just for you to you know get familiar with it. And we talked about p-values here in terms of whether something is significant. Now, what are we observing here in a linear regression like this? So the best way I can explain it. The coefficient here of 0, 0.64629, let's just round it to 0, 0.65, so two decimals. What does it tell us? Well, it tells us for each increase by, say, 1 in the height of the parent, so the mid-height of the parent, the height of the child will increase by 0, 0.65. That's what it will tell us. First of all, then we have for each of these estimates, there's an error attached, a standard error, so the average error that is committed. This is oversimplifying a lot. I do. Okay. So in this case here, listen to Conrad here. He is correct. So with regression, regression X on Y, but making it explicit. Very good. So to recap this a bit, no, you know what? Let's actually just clarify what I have on the screen right now here. We are making a linear model where we're trying to explain why being the mid height, um, being the height of the child, as a function of the mid height of the parent. You're regressing x on y. In this case, this is what we call a simple linear regression because it contains one explanatory variable. Thanks also for pointing this out again, Conrad. Thank you very much. What we have here again, we say that we see now here you have an estimated coefficient. If you divide this by the standard error here in the second column, you obtain a T value. A T value being one you can look back in your statistics book and you can simply see, okay, is this significantly, is this significant? Well, again, oversimplification. But what it means here, it helps us tell whether this coefficient here is significantly different from zero, i.e., do we have enough evidence to reject the underlying null hypothesis of this coefficient being equal to zero. What it can help us tell is the p-value here. This p-value here tells us whether this actually is rejected or not, whether this null hypothesis is rejected or not. What you observe here, there's a code for significance here. You see there's three stars, which means that for three stars means that the p-value here is virtually zero. When the p-value takes, in practice, let me say that, a value, let's just for the simplification, you say anything below 0 0.1, that is 
below 10%, we will deem this as significant, just for now. So what we observe is there's a significant impact here. That this coefficient is significant different from zero. Now, this is a lot of new stuff and it may seem very complicated this year. Hopefully it's not, but it may be. I'm gonna leave the rest of the table for now because we're gonna come back again and again to these tables and for each time we get back, I'll add a little extra. But this is just how we would look at such a coefficient. What does it actually mean? So in short, increase parents by one, you see this increase in child. Is this coefficient significant and different from zero? Look at the stars. If it has stars, yes. That was the simplest way to put this. Now, when we use the LM package in R, all this is done automatically for us behind the scenes, of course. However, let me show you the actual formula for calculating X and Y. So calculating what we call your dependent variable, or not calculating dependent, why I'm actually just shitting you here. So what I'm, when we calculate actually the intercept and the slope, each of these has a formula attached to them, how to calculate them. Now let's build it up bit by bit, starting on my line 84. I will then set my dependent variable, the one we're trying to explain, which is the height of the child, I will set that as my y. I will then correspondingly set the mid height of the parent as my x. In this case here, my independent variable that I'm trying to explain y with. This two formulas here that we see on line 86 and 87 here will calculate the slope coefficient and the intercept coefficient respectively. How these formulas are derived is not a topic for this course, but I will guarantee you, you'll get back to this and you'll be asked to derive these, well, manually. So what you see here, beta one is derived as the correlation between y and x multiplied by the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. That's how you would calculate beta one, beta one being our x coefficient or slope coefficient. That is the coefficient that will be attached to, uh, attached to our independent variable, in this case, the mid height of the parent. So you get this. And likewise, this is how you will calculate the intercept beta zero. Put that one in. And now we can put them together to see if we can compare them with the output from the LM function that we called here earlier. This should be the same because this is the formula how to calculate them. So now what we do here with the R bind function here, we are putting, we are attaching or putting together the beta zero and beta one together with the coefficients for y and x that we obtained in my linear model that I estimated here. And we see here, they are identical. Just to show you, this is the underlying formula that is being used when you call the linear model package. Okay, I have put up here a crash course video this is only for if you are interested. This is not examinable material for this course. Let me stress that. So this is just extras if you want to get a quick crash course in how this actually works and also know what the underlying assumptions are of linear regressions. The one of the only assumptions we're gonna be using today that's very important, notice the word linear. That is, we require, English, we require a linear model to pull this off, essentially. So just keep that in mind. This only works if our model is linear. Okay, that's very good, good start. We're gonna get back to that assumption at the end of this lecture. So going here, we can of course just go down here and see, let's look at the output again. We're back at the same output as before. Now, let me introduce a new thing called the R squared. And again, I put a video here to explain R squared even further not example material for this course, but if you're interested in knowing a little about it. What does the R squared say? The R squared here, which also can be found up in the R output here, you see it here, but again, you can just produce it here by summary output dollar sign R dot squared. It is what we call a measure of goodness of fit. What does it tell you? It tells how much the variation Notice the word choice here, variation of y, that is our dependent variable, in this case here was the height of the child, is explained by the variation 
of our independent variable, the x's, in this case here, the mid height of the parent. It explains roughly 21%. That is, it is you are able to say here, this model here is able to explain the variation of our dependent variable by approximately 21%. It simply also tells how well our model fits the data. That's another way of saying it, right? And welcome to Diego, and uh, thanks for pointing this out, Diego. Nice for also to get some clarification in the chat, because this is new to mostly all the students here. Okay, so we have two things here we're doing. When you run such a model here, you have, of course, the actual values that you observe in the data set. So for that, you just look at the data set, and we can see here, okay, these are the actual values that we observe, you can see. But of course, when you estimate such a model as you do here, you can, of course, also obtain predictions. So you can try to predict, given certain inputs, you can try to predict, or the model can try to predict our outcome. Now, first, I'm going to make sure I only print max on 10,000. I can put this a lot lower, but this is just so make sure it doesn't explode all over the place. But actually, I would go this a little lower and just say print a thousand instead. That's a little more uh, okay. Then I will try to predict our outcome. That is, based on the output that we have, that we obtained using this linear regression model, we try to predict. We try to predict our outcome. Now, this is just the outcome that, that is pointed up here, and this is just, I know it's a lot, so just ignore that for now. We can, of course, compare our actual values here of the child with our predicted outcome. When we do that, we can simply see, and because of max print, I omit a lot of rows because I don't want it to be printed all over the place. But if I just go here, you see here, if we have in the actual data set, we observe that the height of the child is 68.2, the model would predict that to be 67.57. You see it's a little off, that the prediction is not perfect, which makes sense because you can also see in the graph here, this line here doesn't hit all the data points straight on the dot, right? So it's not a perfect prediction. You can also see this because the R squared was only around 21%. That means, well, there's a lot up to the 100%, which will give us a perfect fit in this case. Okay. So far, so good. So here you can compare the actual values with the model predictions. Now, we can of course obtain something that's called the mean squared error. And what the hell is a mean squared error? Well, let me try and help you with that. When we talk about statistics, this mean squared error is an estimate or basically an estimator that measures the average of the squared of the errors. So when you look at this line here, let's point the right way. When you look at this line up here, you see from the actual data point somewhere in the data set here, down to the line, there's an error. You're missing the point a little bit. The line doesn't hit all the points perfectly. Now, if you take that distance and you square the distance, you get the squared error. And the mean squared error here, which is, you can see the calculation here, is the difference between, as you can see here, the real value minus the predicted value squared is the second moment. It's basically an estimate of the variance, if this is an unbiased estimator, but it is, right? So it's also what we call a risk function. You're going to get back to that a lot more in future courses. But this here is practically strictly positive, And the lower it is, the better your or the more accurate your prediction is. So you see here we get a value of five, for instance. It's always positive and not quite zero unless it's perfect. But you see here the mean square error actually gives us an estimate of the quality of this model. So if I were trying to add more explanatory variables to explain the height of the child, like uh, the amount, average amount of meals it gets per day or simply nutritional values or something, I may be able to reduce this mean square error because my predictions would maybe become better. Okay, so for the purpose here, the lower mean square error, the better. 
And for instance, parents' income. Thank you very much, Anastasia. That's a very good additional predictor. So you can just think about what else could I add to my linear model in order to increase the explanatory power. We're going to be doing a lot more here today after this one here. This is just the introductory model. So I'm going to add more explanatory variables to explain certain things. But Anastasia, you're pretty correct. That's a very good addition. We can, of course, also obtain uh, our squared. And you can see our squared is also based on the mean square error. You can see how it's calculated. So that's the same as in the summary output. This is just to show how R square is calculated. So you can see the mean square error enters into the function to calculate the goodness of fit measure R square. And of course, we can also use this to try to predict. Well, in this case here, you can try and predict given the height of the child, what the height of the parents would be, or sorry, the other way around, given the height, mid height of the parents, you would predict what the height of the child would be based on this model. That's also what you can do here on, on my line 109. Um, the line numbers on the one that's uploaded on Nestor may be a little different because I pushed, uh, I just made some difference between, uh, I put some distance between the code to chunks here just so I can transition a little uh, better. So it's easy to see the transitions. Let's close this one here. Let's clean this out. So I'm going to clean this out now, guys, because now we're going to go to example number two. This is just to uh, clean up everything. Ooh, I like that. So there we go. Let's go down and look at our second example of linear regression. Now, we're going to be looking at test results because that's always fun to look at. So there's a nice little package here called far away. I know it's not so far away when I put it in here. But as you can see here, in here, there's a nice data set that gives you the marks in a statistics class. Fantastically relevant right here, right? So what do we have in our data set? Let's go look here. We have the grade of the midterm, we have their grade of the finals, the grade of the homework, and then the final grade total in this case, right? So that's what we see. And we also obtain the summary of this stats 500 course, or stat 500, sorry. And we see with the minimum, maximum, everything is here. All these variables here has been, um, what do you call that? Standardized, sorry. So that the mean zero and standard deviation one, such that they're not, as you can see here, I put some extra notes here. So you can see it's not distracted by relative difficulty of each of these tasks and also makes them very comparable because some of these tests or homework or exam may have different point scales and whatnot. So by standardizing this, they're easy to compare. Now, this, uh, that should be fine. And of course, it also makes linear regression much easier, but that's besides the point here. Now, let's just try it out, right? So we put it in as a data frame first, and then let's set up for a plot. We just need to make one plot here. So when I use the par function here on line 156, it's just a one, one. So we don't need to stack more. We just need one plot. Let's make space for the plot. And then let's plot the final grade as a function of the midterm grade. In other words, we are trying to explain the final grade given what they got in their midterm. Okay. Here we see. And what we plot here, so we plot the two things against the other. This is just a normal, regular scatter plot. We can put in a nice line here, the 45 degree line. And you can also see this is given how well your score was on the midterm. So if you scored above average on a midterm, this is what you're predicted to be scored or what they actually scored on their final. That's interesting. So now let's actually put a linear regression line in there. Let's try to regress final grade on midterm. So we're trying to as our dependent variable y and our independent variable x having midterm. Okay, so we just call it g in this case. You can call it what you want. g may be a very bad style thing here, but I'm just calling it g. So now here I obtained a summary. Make it a little smaller here. There we go. Perfect fit. Then we have everything we need up here to be able to see what we're actually doing. What are we seeing here? What do we get? We get an intercept that is, in this case here, practically zero. You see e to the power minus 16, that's small, that's zero. And we obtain, we see here that we have 0, 54, 52. Okay. So we observe here, if the midterm goes up by one standard deviation, we see the standard deviation of the exam go up by 0, 55. I'm rounding to two decimals. Okay. We can, of course, add in the line to our plot so you can see where the regression line is. It's easy for us to do now because we are in two dimensions, right? So... Let me run this piece of code here. And then I also have the correlation matrix that we have here. 
So you see the dotted line that we have here represents the regression line. And then again, that is the line that goes through this cloud of data that gives the best possible fit. Overall, it minimizes the sum of all these squared residuals. That is, if you draw a line from each of these dots down here to the line here, and the square of this, well, the square of this, the line here will minimize it. I got a, um, I got a, a question here in the chat. There's also for Yannick. In this case here, it's about uh, if he tries a B line, it gives an error that plot new has not been called yet. Okay. In this case here, I would let uh, Diego's presence, I'll let Diego deal with that one while I continue here. I hope you don't mind, Yannick, but uh, I can notice on the time frame here, I'm actually taking my damn sweet time doing this. So I may, I'm running a little behind, actually. So I hope that uh, that is okay. Otherwise, if it still persists, of course, I'll do my best to answer it. No worries about that. So how well does the prediction from our model fit the actual observations here? Let's look at it. So here we see if this is the actual value you would get on the finals, and this is what the model predicted for each of these different observations, of course. I can just take one. I just look at the first observation, see it predicts this, but a model predicts that. That's quite off, actually. It's, it's not very precise, as you may notice. Let's see what the mean square error is this time. Let's see what the mean error is. You see, mean square error is actually 0, 0,69. Doesn't seem too bad. What is the R square then? What do we get? Let's print out R square to see. What did R square tell us again? R square is a goodness of fit. And how do we interpret this 0, 0,30? I'm rounding to two decimals. It says here that the variation of x, that is the variation of our midterm, explains the variation of our final grade by approximately 30%. Comparing this to our complete previous model, this is better, but, but one thing you should know, you can compare two models with different dependent variables. That's not how R squared works. You can compare different models that just have different independent variables, but not when you change the dependent variable. Uh -uh, that's a no-no. So I've put in an explanation here why this can also be seen as what they call regression to mediocrity. What you notice here, if you have a student, for instance, that performs very well on the midterm, let's look at the graph here, you will notice here, uh, you will notice here that if you score above average in the midterm, you're predicted to score less well on the finals. What does that actually mean? Hmm. It could be a, say, a thing of overconfidence, right? You do the midterm, you're like, this is easy. This is great. I'm going to do well on the final. Then you don't study as much as then meh. On the other hand, if you score less than average on midterm, you're predicted to score better on the finals. Of course, there's many other factors that are not accounted for here. Also put in the explanation here. It could also be plain old luck. It could also be simple the relative difficulty. Sure, the relative difficulty has been kind of controlled for here, but there could be so many other factors. Okay, so I have a line, I have a question here from MV. <clears throat> In my line 162 up here, this AB line here, that is, let me see, coef is just all the coefficients. No, coef here is the coefficient of my slope. So that's the coefficient I obtained for my linear model here, the slope coefficient the one that was beta one earlier. And LTY does here, it tells you the form of the line here, how we get the dotted line. That is for Silke. I hope that helps Silke and I hope that uh, helps uh, MV. This is a fantastic point for me to get some coffee. Getting the dotted line here also makes it easier, of course, to be able to differentiate between the two lines. Otherwise I'm talking about the upper line, lower line, they look the same. You're welcome. MV just, uh, let me see. So you could, I believe you could also done that with at the midterm here, but try that out MV. You're free, you're free to try that one out. But the coefficient here is easy because we only have one coefficient here. So MV, yes, you're right. I think you can do that. Try it out. I can, uh, I will admit plainly that my, um, fantastic. It's very good and we do do this because when we have more predictors, let me call it that, then you have to call them by name exactly. Otherwise you can't find them. So 
These two examples I showed you here with the height data set and the statistics data set in here now shows, of course, hey, this is just a simple linear regression. You're trying to explain why with one X. Let's go to the next example. Here we go to the world of multiple linear regression. And I think, guys, I'm sorry, I'm just going to plow through this whole uh, lecture today because otherwise I don't know how long this is going to take. And this is always a little longer lecture. So I think it's better that we just keep going. Correct me if I'm wrong. But okay, here I have a nice economic data set. It's old, but it's still gold. Ha -ha. So what we have here, we have data on 50 different countries where we get a lot of different data. Let's just check a look at it and simply just explain what we have in the data set. Of these 50 countries, we have the savings rate, how much they actually save, which is personal savings divided by disposable income. We get the share of young people, share of, well, really old people, and we get the per capita disposable income, and all this is in dollars, so I'm strongly assuming this is US dollars. Let me check my notes here. There we go, all oh, perfect. So we get US dollars, right? And we of course also have here a percentage growth of this disposable income. Okay, so now we're trying to explain the savings rate as a function of more than one variable. Now, if you pay your attention here to line 230, again, here I'm using a linear model. I'm having my as my dependent variable, the savings rate, and I'm explaining the savings rate by all these different variables. So these four different variables now. If I would draw this, nah, not happening. So what we see here, we will now get multiple variables to try and help us explain the savings rate. And now it becomes more interesting to interpret these kind of tables. So what do we get? Let's look at a table up here. First of all, the intercept, of course, that where this line would intersect with the y-axis. In other words, it will also tell you if all the other variables were zero, that's technically what the savings rate would be, the base savings rate of, in this case here, let's look here, it is savings rate. So the rate here will be 2857. Now, what does this tell us? <clears throat> we see that there's a negative coefficient here attached to the population of under 15. What does that mean? That means if the percentage of the population under 15 goes up by 1, the savings rate of the country will go down by minus 46 or minus 0 0.46. This is significant. We look for stars. That's the easy way we do it here. So we see that this is actually significantly different from zero. That is, we can actually attach this economic interpretation to it. So does it make sense? I think it makes perfect sense that the savings rate of the country goes down if your younger population increases to one under 15. They're, not, they're, not, they're still in the educational system. They're not saving up at this point. They're much better at spending. I don't know when you guys were under 15 how much savings you guys had, or you just, you know, got your allowance and spend it on well, candy, games, something. <laughs> on the other hand here, what do we observe here with the population over 75? Look here. We see here that if the population of over 75 will go up by one, the savings rate will decrease dramatically a lot. However, we don't observe this to be significant whatsoever. This p-value here, remember when I said this 0 0.10? It's higher than 0 0.10. That means it is not statistically different from zero. We don't have enough evidence to reject the underlying neural hypothesis of this coefficient to be equal to zero. So we can't attach any economic interpretation to this coefficient. Mm -mm. Not happening. However, what we can say, look at the last one here, the growth. Remember, that's the per capita, sorry, that's the percentage growth rate of this per capita income. Uh, it's good you had a savings, uh, Anastasia. I think I belong to the group that, well, savings, what a savings. I got some now, but at that time, I had my child savings because my parents kept them, but that was pretty much it, right? Hmm. And then, coming from Denmark, um, education is free. You don't pay for education. And every month they give you money for studying. You don't have to pay back. So, Stufi, you didn't have to pay back. It's fantastic. The English system plus one, right, for that one. So, I have no study debt because of that. 
that's a good thing. Returning to the interpretation of this coefficient here. What do we see here? We see here, if the growth rate goes up by 1, we see that the savings rate will go up by 0 0.41, and rounding it to two decimals. What, do we, what does that mean? Well, let me first explain, is this significant, yes or no? It is. Look, there's a star. And you see that the p-value here is less than 5%. So we say it is significant at the 5% level. And so what do we see here? We see there's a significant impact here. There's a significant effect of an increase in the percentage growth rate of the EPI on the savings rate. That's cool. That's good. So we see there's something here. Likewise here on DPI itself, we don't find anything. The coefficient is virtually zero. It's very small. And we see that the p-value is very high. In other words, we also don't observe any stars. Okay? That's one thing. There's another thing we can interpret here. Look at the r squared again. This r squared is not bad, I think. What we see here, we see that the variation of all these x variables, all these independent variables, the variation of these four variables explains the variation in the savings rate by approximately 33.85%. Okay? Keep this interpretation in mind. If you don't see it in the exam, you will definitely see it in a reset. That's a guarantee. So, more about that later. Okay. Let's come by, let's look at the, how the predictions from the model will match up with our actual values that are observed in the data set. Let's look at it here. We see here for Netherlands, that's a good one. The savings rate here, the actually observed savings rate, is around 14.65%. The model that we estimated here predicts it to be 14.22. That's pretty good. Now, let's look at Denmark. Yeah, it's Denmark in here. Yeah, we see a very high savings rate here of 1685 but the model would predict this to be 11.45. A little off, but not bad. So you can quickly get an idea of here how the savings rate is given for different countries. But again, this data set here is back from 1960, 1970. It's a while ago. Went around, my parents were born. That's a while back. So, so here you can see some nice, interesting things. Oh, there's a very high savings rate in Zambia, for instance. Very interesting. But okay, that will for now conclude um, example number three. Okay, a little uh, coffee sip break here. And also, time to ask. Is the pace okay? Is it okay this way? Let me know, guys. I'll take a sip of coffee. There we go. 24. Okay. Very good question from uh, MV here. So, have you ever, ever heard of the term an outlier? Imagine now if we were to scatter plot this in a higher dimension, and you see that Zambia, for instance, have a very high savings rate here. Then, of course, the line you would draw is very likely to be quite far away from this, which also means that the prediction that you have for things that are quite far away becomes worse. So you're better off predicting things that lays in the middle area. That's what's happening here in, in the most simple way I can put it. So that will also make sense. Also, if you go to the very low savings rate, take an example of Tunisia, for instance. You also see it's quite off, actually. Quite off, right? So that's just to give an example here. Thanks for responding here. I do have a no, but that, that happens. And then I'll try my best to keep the, you know, uh, keep the pace at a good way. Okay, so Jordi, this is a very good question. So Jordi asks, do we need our R square to be a certain number for a model to be useful? So for people who participate in the statistics course with me, I don't personally like R square that much. There's better choices out there, but it's the simplest way to interpret things. 
For the purpose here, you don't need to hit a certain target. Actually, what is typically seen in the real world of data is that if you have micro data, data on household firms like, like this, R square is typically very low, no matter what you do. It's maybe one, two percent or something. On the other hand, if you have a time series data, suppose you observe a price series or a stock price over time, the R square tends to be very high, on the other hand, like above 0 0.80, 0 0.90. And that's just the way the data is, st is structured this way here. But for the purpose here, the answer is a plain no. You don't need to hit a certain target for your model to be useful. You can just say the higher the R squared, the better the goodness of fit of the model is, the better the current model fits the data. Or the more the variation of the X's explains the variation of the Y. Is that okay for you, Jordy? Let me know. Meantime, I'll take the poll down. Okay, very good so far, guys. Then we move on to linear regression example number four. I can tell you there's five. So in terms of examples, we're more than halfway. Very good, very good. Now, this one here is interesting. We're gonna be looking at claims. Claims for policies on cars, you know. I don't know how many of you have a driver's license and whether you have been involved in any, um, let's say, unfortunate events. Let me see about that. So let's see this. What do we have here? We have a nice little data set regarding all these auto claims. And there's a lot of data in here. There's really a lot. So displaying the first 10 rows of the data gives me so much stuff here. Like there's so much to look at here. So you can, when you go through this here again, either you rewatch the lecture again, or you sit with the, sit with the script a little for yourself here, just take your time to look it through. But let's just look through here how it is. What do we have? We have, well, let's go down first to find the correct data set because there's many here. We have an auto claim data set here. It is more than 10,000 records of these things here on 29 different variables. So now we're going really big. So what we see here, we have the policy number, the date, we have for two dependent variables we're gonna to try to model here. First, we're gonna to try to see how many claims have a person made in the past five years. So the number of claims, that's this one, claim frequency. That's gonna be our first dependent variable. Then later on, we're gonna look at the claim amount. How much have they claimed in the past five years? Right? We have the number of driving children, the distance to work, for instance, the value of your vehicle. Like, do you have a shitty little car? Or do you drive a fat BMW? Basically, the nicer car. The number of policies you have. There's so many different things here. The color of the car is red or no. There's so many trying to explain things here. We have the age of the driver. We also have the years of your current job, your animal, uh, animal income, yes, annual income, not animal income. Wow. And then we have the gender of the driver. That's going to be interesting. Let's just ta take that one in for a moment and see what the predictions will be for this one. And um, I may be married to one of the few women who says women shouldn't drive. She says that herself, but she doesn't have a license. Everybody should drive. Just be careful. So let's just see. I don't think men drive particularly better, so it's just dangerous. You should just get automatic cars, let them drive you for you when they're deemed safe. But uh, it is fun to drive, so okay. Okay, let's take a look at this. I'm gonna build a nice, huge model here first. I put in some notes here of how R deals with these sort of categorical variables, for instance. And I got all kind of nice uh, chatting going on here, so Conrad, Men drive more, so they make more mistakes. You're not wrong. If you drive more, as a, so suppose men drive more, then there then there's more time in which they can make mistakes. So they're more the exposure time is higher. That will make sense. That's reasonable. Very reasonable. Yes, you can use trains, Anastasia. Very good. We can also use bikes. We can use boats, planes, teleporters when they're invented. There's many options, right? But um. Let's build this model here. We are trying to explain the claim frequency based on all these different variables. That's going to be fun. Let's look at see what we get. Running this huge model, we get the following outcome here. Whoop. Boom, this is big. 
I'm just going to look at a few of these variables, because if I have to explain all of these, we will be done with a lecture tonight at dinner. That's not the point here. So let's look at this here. Travel time. Let's start with that one. Let's see. What is travel time? What is that? Okay, I know what it is here, but let's see uh, what it does. It's just an integer. Okay, so we see here. When the travel time increases by one, we observe that, okay, move the dot three times to the left. Uh, we see that the number of claims you have go up by 0 0.002, roughly. So it's relatively small. But of course, this is just the travel time, I believe, into distance to work. So say each mile, if this is a miles, but wait, this is from SAS, I, uh, uh, actually. So this may be in kilometers. So what we observe here indeed is, okay, for each additional kilometer, say, the amount of claims in the past five years go up by 0 0.002, if I'm not mistaken. What do we see here? Oh, the p-value here is below 1%. So we can say that this coefficient here is statistically different from zero. So we can attach economic meaning to this. So we see that it has a, a, a real impact on this. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, MVR points, what are that? What is that? What is that? I don't remember half of these things here, so I have to look up the, look up the stuff here. Uh, MVR violation records, ooh, that's interesting. We also got CLM flag, yes. So what is CLM flag? Oh, I've got so many cool things here. Hmm, can I find it here? That's better. That's the bigger question. Let's do this so I can see more at the same time. Otherwise, this takes forever. Whether the claim is reported. Okay. We also have the blue book. We also have... Oh, I found gender. That's nice. What do we observe, first of all? <clears throat> Positive coefficient. So what do we see here? Gender M. Hmm, how is that actually set here? Factor. The gender driver is male M. So in this case, M here, that means if you are male driving, so a man, right? What do we see? We see a positive coefficient. Interesting. So what do we observe? We observe if you are a man driving here, the amount of claims that you have in the past five years goes up. Yes, I said goes up by, in this case, 0 0.00. 8969. Great. This coefficient is significant at the 5% level. So this underlying null hypothesis of this coefficient being equal to zero is rejected. Ergo, it is statistically different from zero. Thus, we can attach economic meaning to this. So if you're a man, you get more claims in the last five years. And this may, may come back to Conrad's command, uh, comment here about men drive more so they make more mistakes. Perhaps. What else do we have? So let's, is there any other thing we can look at? If you are married, you are less likely to have more claims. This one is statistical significant at 10%. Basically, it tells you, well, you're maybe facing a, a much more severe penalty if you crash your car because your wife will kill you when you get home, gets home. I assume that will happen if I crash our car. So that would mean that in this case here, if you are married, you're less likely to mess up your car or make claims in this case here. That's also interesting. So we see a lot of cool things in this table here. But the difference between the previous models we did and this one here is that we added even more explanatory power. I got a question in the chat, so let's see this here. Um, why does it look at male even though you did not specify that? Because I believe it looks at male here because it says gender M. The way R deals with this is that it takes the, the I have to do pronunciation. It takes the variable, and this is here, and attached to M. So it says when this is one, this is what we call a dummy variable. Zero in this case means a woman driving, a woman. And then a one in this case means a male driving. I think that's uh, that uh, things that maybe you're uh, referring to here, Steinhagen. Let me know. Uh, so that's why I'm referring to a male here when I'm interpreting this. Had this one here, for instance, been an F here, this would have been female one, so I would interpret the other way around. That's why I'm interpreting. So the base category here is female, and the category here when this one is one is male. So this here gives you the difference between male and female claims. So you see the number of claims if you're a man is this amount higher than if you're female. 
Does that help you, Steinhagen? Let me know. Now, on the other end, let's look at the claim amount. So one thing is, how many claims do you have? But how big is the claim amount? See, that's also very interesting because, well, you may scratch your car a little here and there, but what if you total it? Or what if you total something else? So, right, so the claim will be much higher. And you're welcome, Steinhagen. Happy to help. Let's run it, and let's look at a table here. again. Let's start all the other way around, because we didn't talk about the R squared, but let's talk about for this one. We see that all this here explains roughly, so the variation of Y is explained roughly 25.28% by the variation of all these X's. We notice that that may not seem very high, but notice what I said about microdata. It actually turns out to be relatively low often. But okay, what do we see? Can we see anything here? Oh, there's so many extra things added here. So many, there's a lot of things here. Let's look back at gender here. Here, there's no difference, statistically speaking. But what is the difference here? Wait, ah, what do we have? What do we have? We have so many things. Car types, what do you have a sports car? If you have a sports car in this case here, your claim amount is higher. Well, that's maybe because the car is more expensive. That would make sense. So the claim will automatically be higher. Um, if you are having more years in your current job, so you're more in the same job for more years right now, your claim is also more likely to be higher. Okay, that's also interesting. This is significant at the 5% level indicated by one star. What else do we see, for instance? If you're driving in an urban area, ergo downtown or something like that, right? You also see here that the claim is higher. The claim amount is higher. This is significant and well, it's virtually zero, so it's highly significant. And we see here that this coefficient here rejects the null hypothesis, so it's statistically different from zero. We can therefore attach economic meaning to it. There's some nice things here. Oh, it also shows here if you're a lawyer, your claim amount is lower. Well, that's interesting. It doesn't show anything for the other job classes, being student, managers, doctors, a homemaker, whatnot. It only shows something here for lawyers. <laughs> Damn lawyers. Okay, so we observe here there's many of these variables here. They are what we call insignificant. That means we cannot say that, that these coefficients are statistically different from zero. We can't. I need some more coffee before I continue. Sorry for that, guys. After this one, we got one more example to go. So far, so good. So let me recap a few things for you at this point here. I have uploaded here or linked here earlier in the lecture today here, up here earlier, a video about how R square works, why it's good, why it's bad. It's not a very long video. It's like less than 15 minutes, 10 or something. I don't even remember anymore. I've also given a crash course in the research methods here. You can also show a little more about the assumptions. But remember what I said about the assumptions, because now we're getting back to it here for the final example. What you observe is, for this linear regression model to work, the model that we estimate has to be linear. You notice that all these models that I've written here, for instance, this one, or this one, or the savings one from earlier, or so what, they're all linear in the parameters, in the parameters. So they can all be estimated by uh, this linear models or linear regression. I'm not talking about the estimation technique, which is actually what we call OLS, ordinary least squares. I kind of indirectly mention it, but it's not the point for this course here. You're going to be dealing with this much more in the future, and then you're going to think back, ha, huh, this is what Stefan actually introduced us for in this course. So hopefully it'll come back and maybe help you guys a little bit to explain all these things. But now let's go to the final example where we're going to challenge this assumption of linearity a little more. So what we have here is actually an old assignment that was taken out, replaced by a newer one, but it means I can show you what kind of assignments also used to be in there. And this also is similar in the same difficulty level as the one you have right now. For instance, in the current assignment, you're dealing with Moneyball. I think it's a very good addition from, uh, from Diego. I like this topic. And, uh, and then you also have the favorite, uh, my personal favorite, we're going to do with a Trump assignment this week. So hope you guys enjoyed so far. Let's go in here. We have now a data set here of trees. Yay, trees, like, you know, in the woods, forest, you know, those things. And we have a sample of 31 black cherry trees 
in a national forest over in Pennsylvania, the state, right? Um, what is it called again? The metal state, the steel state, something like that. I don't know your state's names. I know the Sunshine State is, that's Florida, although it's hurricane not half the time, but okay, fine. Besides the point. So these have four exercises here. We're gonna solve them one by one. And then you can see what kind of things we would ask from you in the assignment. And some of the things we ask from you are also very relative, relevant for what we're asking you this week, for instance. So first of all, let's read in this table that we have. Now, actually, I'm gonna clean up what we had here before. And then let's read in this text file I have with the trees. What we see here now, I just have variable one, two, and three. Let's attach the correct names to it by using call names here. So di diameter, height, and volume. Okay, so far so good. So now we have a nice little uh, data matrix here where we have three columns, all of them being numeric, one with the diameter, one with the height, and one with the volume of the tree. And we have, like I said, 31 different trees of these black cherry trees over in Pennsylvania the other side of the ocean. Okay, what do we see here? We first try to use a standard linear model like we did before. So I call it model one. We try to regress volume in this case here, volume here, as a function of diameter plus height. So diameter and height, these two variables try to explain our dependent variable volume. Nothing new there. We've done them many times before already today. But okay, that's what we do first. Let's display here, I just display the coefficients. And here I get the full summary table as we had earlier. Let's look at the full summary table here. This is the full summary table, right? So what do we observe? We see here that both diameter and height are statistically significant. Ergo, we find stars, right? The p-value is in our both cases here below the 10% threshold that we put here, at least for the purpose of this course. We also observe the r squared here being quite high. Hmm, that's interesting. We see an R squared here of 0 0.94.8. That is, the variation of height and diameter explains the variation of volume by 94.8%, which should make sense when we think about our geometry lessons, right? So that was the first model that you had to do. We've written out here, you have to explain the, vo the volume here as an intercept alpha plus two coefficients, beta one and two, being diameter and height. Since R, since R automatically produces your intercept, you see, I didn't even write an intercept this model here. It automatically makes one for you. You have to actually actively tell R not to include a coefficient for the intercept. And this is one of the other assumptions of OLS. You actually should include an intercept indirectly because that takes care of another problem you have. But that's not the purpose of this course. Just know that you should have an intercept in your model for now. Whew. Okay, that's exercise A of this one. Now let's move to exercise B. And this is where it becomes interesting because remember the whole assumption of the model has to be linear. Now, we know that the volume here can be well calculated as a volume of cylinder or cylinder cylinder. And that means here the volume is pi divided by four multiply by diameter squared times height. Okay, we learned that from geometry. Or look it up in a book or Google it. However, this formula in itself is not linear. But one thing you can do to linearize the model is to take logarithms of both sides. So you can make what we call a log-log model. So while this base model here may not be linear, we can make it linear. So by taking logs on both sides, as you see here in line 363, we can be able to estimate this model again as a linear regression model. When you have what we call a log-log model, going back to your microeconomics, we also have elasticities, actually. That's how you would interpret it. So it's percentage-percentage. But not the purpose here. We're just trying to estimate this model. And to be able to do that, there's a few tricks you would have to know, and that's why we display it here. There. I keep having to do it this way because my screen is over there, but it looks weird. Okay, what do we get here? First, we explain this by a linear model, just like before. Volume is fine. However, notice here that the data we take is the log of the data. So we already log the entire data. But what do we do here? We have to generate a new intercept. 
because of in the model that we have here, we have the intercept alpha is log of pi divided by four. That's the intercept. You have to generate that using this rep function here. You could always go and find the explanation for the rep function here, which is just, well, in this case, you're replicating all these elements for each of the rows in tree. So for each of the rows in this data set tree, you are generating this intercept coefficient, which is log pi divided by four. That's how you get this with the rep function. You take, what are you doing for each of these rows? Then we take diameter and height. We have them here, log of diameter, log of height. They are log because you take data log trees here. What does that minus one do here? Minus one here takes away the normal intercept because we generated a new intercept here. If I don't do this here, well, shortly put, we don't get the right result, but this takes away the regular intercept that would have been. And then instead we have this other intercept that we constructed up here. That's what this minus one does. And now we can get new coefficients using this model here. Actually, let's look at the summary of this model here. So let's go down here and let's put a summary of the model here below. Summary model two, I call it two, right? Yeah. So let's look at the summary as we had here before. Now, what do we get here? We also get, wait, look at this R squared. Fantastic, this is almost one. And that's also because, well, that's what we explained again. This is how you would calculate very accurately, at least, the volume of a tree as a volume of a cylinder, a cylinder. Need to figure out what a cylinder, a cylinder. English not being your first language makes it difficult sometimes. I hope that for the purpose of this course so far, you've been able to understand what I've been saying. Otherwise, YouTube has a nice uh, subtitle function that may help if this is difficult. But I hope at least I've been understandable enough so far. <laughs> Otherwise, let me know. Hmm. But this is how you will construct a log log model in R, simply put, which finishes exercise 1B, leaving us with two exercises left for today before we finish today's lecture. Well, we're doing very well today, I think. So far, so good. Moving down here, now we have to generate graphs as we've done before. So actually, when you see this kind of exercise, you should think, ha, I have done this. Oh, I got a very good question here from Max. I'm actually super happy you're asking this. So Max asks us here, what did the adjusted R square mean? For that, I could give a half a lecture just on that alone. It's not per, it's actually plainly put, it's a better one than R squared. That's my opinion. What you can see what it does, please refer back to this video here about R squared then you get an explanation of adjust of R squared what it is. I explain very clearly what it is and why it may be preferred over R squared. You're going to deal with it in later courses. But again, if you're interested in knowing it, the link is right there. And then you can go and check it out. I give a nice little explanation about that. That's how R squared, adjusted R squared is. So I'm just going to leave that with that for now, Max. I hope that's okay. Because not important here, but I do give a link to an explanation for it directly where I explain it myself. Is that fine with you, Max? Let me know. We have to make four graphs, guys. Four graphs. Woo, that's fun. So first of all, we have to first, for each of the two models, plot the actual value of the volume against, well, the predicted volume. You're welcome, Max. Secondly, we also have to make some histograms of the prediction error. So, you know, how much error are you committing for each of these predicted values? And based on these graphs, we have to come up with a prediction. We have to come up with a recommendation, say, for which model you think is better. Okay. So we are back at ggplots again. Let's call in the ggplot and let's first get the predictions and get the residuals out. We're going to how do we get them? Well, we have the predicted values here from model one and two. We have done this before. There's a little important twist you have to remember here. See here, EXP here. It's because the model that we estimate number two is a log model. What is the, well, reverse of a log? Exponent. <clears throat> so you have to take the exponent of this one to get it back from logs into, well, regular numbers again. That's where you get this EXP from here. It's like an EXP share in Pokemon, but okay. Enough Pokemon references. It's actually the first one today. 
impressive. Okay, and then of course we obtain each of the residuals from model one and two respectively, which is of course just the difference between the actual observed value and the predicted value. This is what we call the error, right? So we have all these four things here. Now we have all the components that we need to plot. So far, so good. So now let's start building the big plot we have to make using ggplot. The way you do this is you kind of have to set the stage with a base plot. You've seen this before. You probably, yeah, you also dealt with this in assignment before. So this should not be something new. But what we are doing here, we are building four plots now. First, we're building two scatter plots we have up here. And then down here, we're building two histograms, right? So first, we have the first scatter plot. That's for model one which we're scattering the predicted values against the actual values. We even label it here so we can see it. Okay, that's model one. That's model two. If you get the other one, the second one should be simple because they're the same, we just change the names. Now for the histograms, you have to set what the bins should be in this histogram here. So you can adjust the bins here, that we do. And then of course we plot both of these histograms here or we load them in into ggplot. And then we can plot this entire grid here, which is the four by four grid we have made. What do we see? Let's look at first the uh, scatter plots. For model number one, we see, actually for both models, we see that if you were to draw a line, a straight line through this here, this two dimensional space again, you can see that this line you would draw is pretty good for both cases. Based on these two here, model one or two, and here you can see what the estimated error is, model one or two. Actually, let me ask you guys on the class, based on these graphs here, so look at these graphs here. Would you pick model one or model two as your estimated model? I'll wait a little bit. We have 10 votes here. That's pretty good. Let's see. How many viewers do we still have? Around 60. That's pretty good, guys. Pretty good. And MV, yes, you can do that too. I'm just doing a little different things here. But in these, you can also set up the plot grid here like this. You're welcome. Just leaving uh, people to answer this a little bit. We got 16 votes. Guys, I see almost 60 people watching. I know that a lot of people that are just watching this in the background be like listening to my voice as they fall asleep in their chair or whatever. But it's nice for you guys just to just to pitch in sometimes here. It's just nice to see. You know, also because I'm just sitting here and talking to the screen. I see myself on the screen, which gets creepy after a while. Ugh. But lecturing online is... Wow, I don't mind it so much. It's a little different. I can sit at home here. I don't have to wear pants if I don't want to. Well, I am wearing pants, so let's get that out of the way. But, you know, you can just be more relaxed. 27 votes. That's okay with me. Thanks for voting in here. And actually, let me take this one here and move it away a little bit. We're going to move it over here for now. I'm going to leave it up here. Just to remember what your vote was, guys. So we're going to leave the vote for a bit here. going to keep it active. While I go and look at question D. Question D is simple. At least it should be very simple. Just obtain the R squared and see whether it supports your conclusion. And this is where you can make your decision based on which R squared is higher. And, uh, well, let's just compute R squared. I show two ways to do it here, each yielding the same result, of course. What do we observe? Model two, or sorry, let's start with model one, gives you an R squared of 97. 795 and the other one was 9995. In this case here, as we already kind of predicted based on our linear models we estimated earlier, it seems that model two provides a better fit of the data than model one because we're using this, well, what we learn in geometry, how to calculate a volume of a tree using this as a proxy of a volume of a cylinder. I think it's cylinder, not cylinder, cylinder. There we go. So indeed, for the majority here, about 88.9%, you're correct. 
it is indeed model 2 i would believe based on this although i would like to say model 1 is not bad at all not bad at all but model 2 becomes it gives a more precise estimate now let's hide this from my overlay here ah clicking around is always fun and actually this here concludes the last example for today so not too bad Ah, bonus points we don't give like that no 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 I've already, we already put up a bonus point here for you guys here in the assignment. Check it out. There's a bonus point to get for each of the divisions, which means we have, we have eight divisions, of course, in the course, each of your divisions from where you're a cadet. Then one team from each division will get a bonus point for the assignment in this case, which could be very nice, guys. So make you a good Trump, Trump tweet generator. So I got some questions here in the chat. Let's deal with them first. So first, Jordi asks, when making a scatter plus, does it matter if you use GM point or GM jitter? I would personally use GM point, but I think GM jitter in this case will uh, arrive at the same result. I must honestly say I haven't tried GM jitter. So please just try it out. You can simply just try it out and see if it gives a different result. A lot of these things here is just trial by error. So I know it's not the perfect answer, but best I can give right now because I simply didn't try myself. Now, Conrad, and yeah, it's like Cyril. Ah, thanks. That helps a bit. That certainly does. And um, yeah, at this point here, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention, guys. It's been a fun lecture as usual. And uh, well, I wish you the best of luck with assignment number six. And remember, we still have a lecture next week. And then, of course, we have our Q&A session also before the exam. And well... I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and until next time.